The American Story, The Beginnings by David Barton and Tim Barton as read by Carl Hirsch. The American Story highlights some of the interesting moments and people that revealed God's providence in America. We have a fascinating history that must be remembered and passed on to future generations. Section 5 The American Republic Chapters 1, 2, and 3, The Second Great Awakening, Notable Leaders and National Organizations, as well as Missionaries and Mission Movements, Jason Lee in Oregon. A decay of morality always leads to a reduction of liberty, freedom, and prosperity. When that loss of national morality occurred in the 1700s, a national revival known as the First Great Awakening helped restore America and save its culture. By the early 1800s, the positive influence of religion and morality was once again waning. The decline was noticeable even by civic leaders, whose official prayer proclamations called for a rekindling of true religion across the land. Their prayers were eventually answered in what historians call the Second Great Awakening, which spanned the 19th century decades leading up to the Civil War. That spiritual movement began in Kentucky and Tennessee and spread through the other states. Many Americans were converted or came back to the Christian faith, and many new churches and Christian denominations were started. Religious leaders in the Second Great Awakening included notables such as Barton Stone, James McGrady, John McGee, Harry Hoosier, Lorenzo Dow, Charles Clay, Peter Cartwright, and Charles Finney. And numerous circuit riding preachers also traveled the frontier of America, setting it aflame with the gospel. In fact, Legendary Methodist Bishop Francis Asbury, 1745 to 1816, spent 45 years spreading the gospel and founding schools, traveling more than 300,000 miles in the saddle. Richard Allen, 1760 to 1831, was a prominent black minister who became well known during the Second Great Awakening. While a slave in Maryland, he became a Christian after a circuit-riding Methodist minister preached on the plantation where he lived. Allen's resulting change in behavior influenced his master to become a Christian. Allen was able to purchase his freedom and move to Philadelphia, where he became a minister, preaching to both black and white congregations. He served in the American War for Independence, and over subsequent years helped build many churches often assisted in his endeavors by his friend, signer of the Declaration, Benjamin Rush. In 1816, he founded the African Methodist Episcopal AME denomination, the first black denomination in America. Harry Hoosier, 1750 to 1806, another famous black American minister, was born into slavery in North Carolina. He was sold north to Maryland, where he eventually gained his freedom and became a Christian. He traveled with noted minister Francis Asbury, and although Asbury drew massive crowds, Harry drew even larger ones. Signer of the Declaration Benjamin Rush said that considering Hoosier had no formal education, he was the best orator Rush had ever heard. Hoosier was particularly effective in helping reach the average laborers who were the backbone of America, but had little formal education. Those converted under Harry's ministry became known as Hoosiers and gradually moved west into Indiana. This is most likely how Indiana got its nickname as the Hoosier State. Perhaps the best known name associated with America's second national revival was the Reverend Charles Finney, 1792 to 1875. His personal story is unusual, for he became a Christian by studying to be an attorney. 
While poring over his legal textbooks, Finney was struck by their constant references to the Bible as the basis of civil and moral law. As a result, he began to seriously study the Bible, which eventually led him to his conversion. He then became a minister, helping bring both religious and moral reformation to the nation. He was also president of Oberlin College, a leading college in America in respect to treating all students equally, regardless of race or gender. Sadly, Oberlin, like so many other universities today, no longer follows or believes the Bible, biblical teachings that were essential to its founding as a Christian college. Finney was an ardent abolitionist and led Christians to boldly speak out against slavery across the country. He and his students were actively involved in the anti-slavery movement. When surrounding Christian colleges refused to stand against that evil, large numbers of their students left those colleges and came to his. They became part of active efforts to free slaves, and on one occasion even directly intervened against the government by rescuing a slave from a U.S. Marshal who was holding him under the onerous Fugitive Slave Act of 19, 1850. The Fugitive Slave Act was one of the most reprehensible laws ever passed by Congress. It allowed Southern slave owners and slave hunters to go into the North to retrieve runaway slaves. This law denied due process rights to anyone accused of being an escaped slave. Simply by being accused, they were deprived of their constitutionally guaranteed rights to habeas corpus, trial by jury, and testify in their own defense. The despicable law even stipulated that if a federal magistrate ruled that the accused was a former slave and sent him to slavery in the South, he received $10. But if the judge ruled the accused was free and could remain in the North, he was paid only $5. Not only were many escaped slaves returned to the South, which was bad enough, but many free blacks were kidnapped and dragged into slavery because of this law. Finney taught Christians that only through political action could such bad laws be changed and those who made them removed from office. He forcefully urged, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. The time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics. God cannot sustain this free and blessed country which we love and pray for unless the church will take right ground. Politics are a part of a religion in such a country as this, and Christians must do their duty to the country as a part of their duty to God. He, God, will bless or curse this nation according to the course they, the Christians, take in politics. Additionally, believing that specific actions could foster a spiritual renewal, Finney taught the science of revival in his famous Lectures on Revival of Religion. Estimates showed that in just one year of his revival services, the 57, 50, 1857 to 1858, at least 100,000 Americans became Christians, with countless more coming to Christ over the duration of his ministry. He further transformed the culture by his extensive influence on thousands of pastors who began to speak out on issues of the day. Many notable spiritual leaders stepped into the forefront during the Second Great Awakening, and numerous Christian organizations were also started during this time, including Bible societies. Founding Father Benjamin Rush helped organize the first one in 1809. And over the next eight years, 120 additional Bible societies were birthed. In 1816, the American Bible Society, America's first national Bible society, was formed when dozens of local, state, and regional societies linked arms. 
Among its officers were many national notables, including Elias Budno, President of the Continental Congress and Framer of the Bill of Rights, John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, John Langdon and Charles Coatsworth Pickney, signers of the Constitution, Smith Thompson, Secretary of the Navy and a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, William Wirt, a U.S. Attorney General, Matthew Clarkson, Major General in the War for Independence. Shortly after it formed, John Quincy Adams, President of the United States, and John Marshall, Supreme Court Chief Justice, also became officers. In addition to Bible societies, the revival also encouraged evangelical opposition to Indian removal. It also prompted the founding of numerous abolition and philanthropic societies, as well as the American Tract Society, the American Sunday School Union, and other Christian organizations that helped change the spiritual and cultural direction of America. The work of sending Christian missionaries to teach the Bible in remote locations expanded greatly in the 18th century. And just as the desire to propagate the gospel had been an important motivation for the colonization of the original 13 colonies, the same devotion continued to influence the establishment of later states as well. One example is that of the Reverend Jason Lee, 1803 to 1845, a principal force in forming the state of Oregon. Jason was the youngest of 15 children and was just three when his father, who had been a soldier in the American War for Independence, died. Jason learned to provide for himself and became self-sufficient at a young age, become a Christian at age 13. At age 26, Jason entered college to study for the ministry, and in 1832 became a pastor. In 1833, he read an article in The Christian Advocate that changed the course of his life. The Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1803 to 1804, led by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who had been sent by President Jefferson to explore the vast and newly purchased Louisiana Territory, which extended from the Gulf of Mexico in the southeast to Canada in the northwest. It had literally doubled the size of the United States. As the group was traveling through the Pacific Northwest, some natives apparently witnessed members of the expedition and subsequent trappers practicing various aspects of their Christian faith in ways that seemed curious and even strange to the tribes. They observed them resting on the Sabbath, praying and reading the Bible. These were new practices to the Indians and printed books such as the Bible were unknown to them. Members from the expedition explained to the curious onlookers that the book they were reading gave instructions on how to properly worship the God of heaven. Upon completing their exploration, the group returned east, but long after they were gone, the Indians talked about the religious practices they had seen. On his return, William Clark stayed in the Missouri region within the Louisiana Territory. He spent the remainder of his life there, first as territorial governor, then as U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs. In the early 1830s, while serving in the later role, four members of the Nez Pierce tribe in the Oregon Territory journeyed east to meet with Clark and St. Louis. The natives came to learn more about the religious practices they had witnessed er years earlier. They inquired of Clark, but according to a report of the meeting, Clark did little to help them. On their departure, one Indian told him, I came with one eye partly open for more light to my people who sit in darkness. I will go back with both eyes closed. My people sent me to get the white man's book of heaven, but I have not found it. I am going back to the long, sad trail to my people of the dark 
land. My people will die in darkness, and they will go on the long path to the other hunting grounds. No white man will go with them, and no white man's book will make the way plain. I have spoken. The Indian delegation returned home disappointed. Portraits of two of the four Indians who met with Clark, whose names were Rabbit Skin Leggings and No Horns on His Head, were made famous by uh, were made by famous Indian painter George Carlin, who traveled with the tribe members on their way home. Caitlin made five separate journeys to the West in the 1830s to paint members of the Western tribes. A worker within Clark's office related the account of what happened. When the Christian advocate published the report in March 1833, calls immediately spread throughout the eastern United States for missionaries to be sent among Western Indians to teach them about the, quote, Book of Heaven, for which the Inez Pierce had been searching. Jason Lee had long expressed interest in working as a missionary among the Western tribes. Once the article was published, his denomination selected him to establish a mission to Indians in the Oregon Territory. He arrived there in 1834. At that time, the Oregon Territory was a vast region, many times larger than today's state of Oregon. The territory encompassed all of what is now Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, as well as parts of Wyoming, Montana, and Canada. Hundreds of different native tribes populated the area. Over the decades prior to Lee's arrival, five different nations, Russia, Spain, France, Great Britain, and the United States, claimed the area within that enormous expanse. Great Britain it vigorously defended it as solely her own even dispatching warships to the region in the War of 1812 to protect it from incursion by others. Disputes over the territory slowly diminished as Russia and Spain eventually ceded their claims to the United States and the French to the British. In 1818, the U.S. and Great Britain reached an agreement for joint occupation of the area. Lee stepped into these intense dynamics in 1834. In 1846, Great Britain finally relinquished to the United States full control of the area from the Canadian border southward to California, but this was after Lee's death. Upon arriving in the territory after months of travel, Lee found the natives where he had planned to go were too fierce and combative, so he turned further south but even with those Indians, he realized that teaching them to live as Christians might take decades. Additionally, after witnessing the political turmoil in the region from the competing international interests, as well as the often vicious conflicts between the various tribes, Lee concluded that securing long-term stability for the entire area would benefit everyone. In 1837, Lee drew up a plan for territorial government, taking it to leaders in Washington, D.C., while also describing to them the beauties and possibilities of the region. Lee then traveled to the eastern U.S., raising support for the mission and recruiting new workers and missionaries. In 1840, he returned to Oregon, bringing some 50 additional individuals with him to help with the work. This became known as the Great Reinforcement. Lee understood that the mission needed to become self-sufficient. At that time, Great, Britain, Great Britain's Hudson Bay Company had a monopoly in providing food and supplies for settlers and trappers. So Lee and the others were reliant on the British and largely at their mercy. To become more independent, Lee and those with him built a granary, a large storehouse for harvested grain and crops, sawmill, grits mill to grind grain into flour, a trade school for Indian youth, and a college, now known as Willamette University. 
The chapel they started is still in operation today as Salem's First Methodist Church. To further become self-sustaining, Lee helped form the Willamette Cattle Company. A group from the mission traveled far south to California, which was then Mexican territory, where they purchased 750 head of cattle and 40 horses. Throughout the treacherous 700 mile journey back to the mission, they lost almost 200 cattle, but the remaining livestock enabled them to become self-supporting. Lee continued to pursue increased stability for the region, and by July 1843, there was a territorial government in place. He returned east to attend to mission business and became sick. While visiting family in Canada, he died and was buried there in 1845. His remains were eventually moved back to Oregon. Lee was the first Protestant missionary in the Pacific Northwest and is considered the founder of Oregon. In 1864, Congress passed a law allowing each state to display statues of two of its heroes at the U.S. Capitol, and Oregon chose the Reverend Jason Lee as one of its two honorees.